Julia offers both speed and relative familiarity to users of other high-level languages. While an incredibly advanced tool, it has a rather shallow learning curve for beginners. With that said, it can feel comparatively unresponsive when performing simple tasks. Julia's latency is primarily felt in three ways, starting up, loading packages, and executing code for the first time. In this video, you'll learn how to tackle each of these pain points by adopting a standard workflow and commonly used packages. When you start a language by executing a script or open a REPL, it has to load the runtime whose job it is to talk to the operating system. The runtime's responsibilities include memory management on the stack and heap, how variables are stored and accessed, and handling exceptions. All languages have to do this, but Julia may be comparatively slower for two reasons, its compiler and its standard library. Firstly, starting Julia means loading its JIT compiler, which takes longer than loading an interpreter because compilers include a much more extensive optimization step between reading human input and emitting executable code. Secondly, the runtime is large due to an extensive standard library whose compiled code is loaded every single time you start a Julia session. Extending the standard library with user-designed packages is a core part of the standard Julia workflow. However, loading a package is more complicated than just unzipping pre-compiled code into a form that the runtime can understand, which is the process for a statically typed language like C++. Julia's speed comes in part from a compilation step called inlining, where function calls within other functions have their code baked into the compiled code of the outer function. However, if these inner functions change somehow through extensions on types that the function hasn't seen before, or redefinition on types that it has, then suddenly the outer function's code is invalid and must be recompiled. This process, called cache invalidation, is recursive, and so recompilation may cascade into a huge number of upstream functions. This means that when you load a package, and in turn introduce new types and functions, you can't just assume that the code you've already compiled will still be valid. This problem gets way worse when your code exhibits type instabilities, which is where the compiler doesn't have enough information to determine how a certain variable should be represented in memory. For more information, check out this very well-written blog post by Jakob Nissen, which goes into the story of how Julia's latency has evolved over the course of the past few years, and where it's going in the future. The compiler is also responsible for slow time to first execution. Before code is run, the types involved are determined and only then can the compilation of specialized machine code begin. This compilation is handed off to LLVM, which notoriously cares more about making the output code fast than making the compilation process itself fast. Based on what we've already discussed, the immediately obvious best way to make Julia run faster is to keep the same REPL open for as long as possible. This means that when you run code, much or all of what has been run has already been compiled, and so the long process of generating efficient code has been completed. For this reason, I wouldn't recommend working on scripts and running them from a new Julia session each time, as you may do in Python. My preferred way of developing Julia is interactively, using an editor such as VS Code or JupyterLab, one which allows me to keep a Julia session open while sending code to be executed. However, keeping the same REPL open means that it can get polluted by functions that you don't need anymore, but we can address this using Julia's package system. Local packages are one way of organizing your code. They allow you to separate your code into stuff you're actively working on and features that are more or less finished. To create a new package, in the REPL, go into package mode with the right square bracket key and then write generate my package. Then, to add the package to your current environment, still in package mode, write dev dot forward slash my package, where the dot forward slash is needed to tell Julia that the package you're looking for is local and not in the online package directory. Next, define the functionality that you'll need inside the my package module, and now you can just use it like any other package you've installed. Finally, whenever you need to make a change to the package, all you have to do is change the code inside the package and reload the package to refresh the module. Luckily though, this fourth step is actually redundant, as the sole purpose of the revised package is to automate this reloading process whenever a change is made to a package that is loaded after revise. You don't even have to load revise manually. You can just add revise to your global Julia environment which is where Julia falls back to if it can't find a package in your local environment, and put using revise in your startup.jl file. This brings us nicely to the second standard way of making Julia feel faster, making use of local environments for different projects. 
This is as simple as making a new folder and in package mode running activate new folder. This ensures that invalidations and recompilation only happen with respect to the packages of the environment that you're in. Otherwise, when Julia attempts to pre-compile a new or updated package, it has to consider all the packages you've ever used, as opposed to the ones that you will actually use in whatever you're currently working on. If you use VS Code, you can tell Julia to open a certain environment whenever you start the REPL, so even manually activating is unnecessary. It's worth noting, however, that there are things that can't be revised due to technical limitations, the most important one being structs. There are two workarounds, though, for this issue that each have their own drawbacks. First, you could put the work in progress struct inside of a module instead of defining it in the main namespace, which lets you overwrite the entire module whenever you want to update the struct. The drawback of this is that the old module actually still exists, and you have to rerun some lines of code to make sure the current state isn't haunted by the ghosts of the old module. Secondly, you could give the struct a temporary name and rename it every time you need to change something, and then give the true name to an alias variable which can be used as a stand-in for the real thing. The downside of this is that the alias is dynamic, and so there are performance implications. So just make sure that you've removed all of your dynamic aliases by the time you actually run your performance necessary code. Once you're comfortable with using local environments and local packages with Revise, Julia should already feel more responsive. For hybrid user developers, which Julia encourages you to become, I would argue that what I described is the standard workflow, and I program like this for almost any project which outgrows a single file. However, these next steps address package loading and time to first execution more aggressively. That is to say, they're not as widely used, but if they fit your workflow, then you should try them out. The first technique is using precompile tools to tell Julia to compile certain function methods that you're going to use in your current project. This means that when a certain line is run, execution can begin immediately. If you're using the local package technique, add precompile tools to its dependencies, and at the bottom of your module, add an example workflow wrapped in a precompile tools dot at workload block. If you're not developing a local package, you can still use this method to speed up execution by generating a custom startup package deving it into your local environment and adding a workflow just as before. Now you can simply import the package and all of the compiled code will be loaded without any compilation necessary. Earlier, I mentioned that due to Julia's dynamic nature, loading packages involves much more than just deserializing machine code. But once any cache invalidations have been cleaned up, it would be nice not to have to do it all again the next time. This is where the capabilities of package compiler comes in. It allows you to specify a list of packages that you want to have ready as soon as Julia is opened. Essentially, they become part of your own custom standard library. In the script running on screen, I specify some packages that I use often and then generate a sys image with all of them preloaded. Now I can use this image directly by making a shell alias for the Julia command, or when I'm working on packages with large dependencies like differential equations or Turing, I can build on top of it. The reason for compiling images incrementally is twofold. Firstly, you only have to compile the packages in the base image once, rather than every time. But also, if you want something to be in an image generated from scratch, it has to be in the project toml, and I don't want to have to muddy my dependencies with the same packages every time. It's worth noting that the process of generating a sysimage freezes your packages at their current versions, meaning you can't update packages that have already been compiled. If you do want to update them, you have to recompile the whole thing. And this brings us to the massive caveat that working with sysimages comes with. It takes so long to compile one. If you've been paying attention to the sped up footage in the background, you saw that my base image took almost nine minutes to compile. And the incremental project image with just differential equations took 22. For this reason, if you're working with packages that you don't have checked out for development, but do update often, I would highly recommend not putting them in your image or just not using this technique at all. Using package compiler is not part of most people's workflow. In fact, only 10% of respondents to my workflow survey included it, compared to 86% for revise. The nature of Julia as a JIT compiled language means that you have to use it a little differently than you might be used to. For those coming from an interpreted language like Python or R, the latency and startup time can serve as a barrier to enjoying using the language. 
You can get around this latency with the techniques we discussed, but there are plenty more workflow tools with a different focus. I'll quickly highlight the core of Julia Formatter, Jet, Aqua, and Cthulhu, as these are commonly used to help write idiomatic Julia code and check for correctness. I hope this video leaves you excited to write some Julia, but I will warn you, if you like writing fast code, Benchmark Tools is like crack.